Praise the Lord, everybody. Lord. You know, I've been watching for them to bring that woman in they're talking about. <laughs> Where is she? <laughs> uh, you know, I never had all those thing, things said about me in my life that I can remember of. And all I had was, go do it. You can do it. My husband, I said, uh, when we started the church, there was nobody who played the piano. He said, you played the piano. And I said, I can't. He said, get up there. You can do it. And so I had to play the piano. One time when he couldn't do the broadcast, he had a cold, and every time he'd open his mouth, he just coughed, you know. And I said, oh, what are you going to do? He always said, we'll go to the conference in St. Louis. We'll bring somebody back home with us and they can take the broadcast. Oh, that's fine. So we went to the uh, conference in St. Louis. When we started to go home Saturday night, he started the motor up, and I said, you're not taking anybody home with us. He said, no, I couldn't do it. After they've come, spent their money to get here for the conference, let me take them up to Hannibal. I said, well, what are you going to do? He said, you're going to do it. I thought, oh, no. <laughs> but it seemed like he felt like anything is due me go do it. <laughs> so you folks have said some good things. So fine, thank you very much. And to correct the thing on Lois, she was just a <laughs> little girl, and her father didn't live for the Lord. He lived just shy of it. And uh, suddenly one day he said, Mother, why don't you want me to marry Lois? I said, well, look at her father. He said, Mother, I'm not marrying her father. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but she has turned out to be a jewel. I said, Lord, she, uh, I told the Lord, he can't take her before he takes my son. My son would just be a... <laughs> <laughs> Without her. So, uh, that's that. So we had uh, a good time, wonderful time. This is a good time now. I was uh, supposed to tell about myself. If I had anything to tell on you, I'd tell it. <laughs> the one thing I can tell on Carolyn, uh, when we, we got uh, the church on Broadway, and when we went there, oh, it was horrible. It was, uh, I'd been sitting idle for so long in the, the uh, set was so deep on everything and it was a mess. My husband didn't think we could do it, you know, uh, have it. He said, I wouldn't have it, they'd give it to me. I said, why? He said, look, everything. I said, well, we'll clean it up. So we called the church together and said, everybody bring a bucket, mop, rags, come on, we're going to clean the church. So that night we cleaned the church and some got so tired, they said, I got to go home. I got to go. They kept one to one leaving. So Carol was still there, and I was working. And I said, Carol, go on home. I know you're tired. You can go. She said, Are you going? I said, Not yet. She said, I'm staying as long as you do. <laughs> and she did. She stayed there till I quit working, and then she went home. So it's wonderful to know the Lord. Well, you want to know something about me? I'm the product of a farmer's family. There was a, a small number of us, only 13 children. But uh, <laughs> naturally, the older ones was married and gone when the younger ones were born. I was number six in the family. And uh, our family was raised, you'd thought my father and mother was preacher and his wife because we told the mark for the Lord. We didn't think we were. I mean, that's the way we lived. You didn't work on Sunday. You didn't do this. You didn't do... And uh, so, anyway, in my heart, God dealt with me as just a child. Mother would tell me, take the baby and go in the uh, other room where the rocker is. Rock them. I have to clean up this mess, the supper dishes and all. And so I'd take the baby in. I was glad she would do it. See, we didn't have electricity. We didn't have no lights, only just a kerosene light. And she had it where she's working, so I was in the dark. I'd sing those old songs as I rocked the baby, and the tears would just roll down my face. And me just maybe seven, eight years old. 
But uh, I always seem like God has had a touch in my life from the beginning. When I was 12 years old, uh, there was a, a preacher that came along and, well, used to people started a church. It's just like a family has a desire and maybe on their property they'll build a building and they'll start having Sunday school. They don't have a preacher. And that's the way with most of the churches when around when I was 12 years old is still like that. And uh, so these uh, two ladies that took care of the Methodist church where I went for revival, they had sent for this man to come and preach a revival. So one night uh, he was preaching and, oh, I wanted to go to the altar so bad. Oh, it, it was awful. But I thought, Mother may not want me to. I mean, we didn't do anything Mother and Dad didn't want us to. I mean, you was afraid to, but yet they didn't they didn't hit us and knock us around, but I don't know. It's like my sister said one time when mother when she was disappointed, you look at her eyes, you could just cry. And if she's disappointed in you, she'd look at you and you wilted. And she didn't say nothing. So uh anyway I, went, I didn't go to the altar because I was afraid Mother wouldn't. She'd think, well, you're just a kid, you know. Only grown-ups was praying and going to the altar and like that. So we got home that night from church. It's just us kids that went. And uh, my sister Pearl was about 18, 19 years old. And I said to her, I wanted to go to the altar so bad tonight, but I was afraid Mother wouldn't want me to. She said, well, Mother would have been glad. I thought, oh, no, I missed it. And so the next night, when soon as Brother Connor said the altar is open, I mean, I landed right in the altar. Some of them said I ran all the way. I don't know what happened to me. And uh, I got the altar, and it was so wonderful. All I could do was cry. I just cried and cried. And there's women that say, you don't have to cry. You don't have to cry. I thought, leave me alone. You know, you don't cry because you're sad all the time. It, it just seemed like there was no words, nothing to do but cry. And they pulled me up from the altar then, set me on the front seat, and, and they'd wipe my eyes, wipe the tears, and they'd say, don't cry. You don't have to cry. You don't. So anyway, finally church got over, and I went home, and, Oh, I felt wonderful. And uh, my job of the morning was to go down to the pasture and get uh, the cow and drive her, bring her up to the house. And then mother milked the cow and I'd take it back to the pasture again. So this morning, oh, I went to the, get the cow and I just seemed like my feet didn't touch the ground. You know they did and I know they did, but it didn't feel like it. And the trees was beautiful, and the birds singing was beautiful, and oh, it was just heaven. I uh, went down and get the cow and bring her home. Well, that night, the revival was over, and we, us kids was ready to go to bed. At sundown, you go to bed because it's dark anyway, no lights or nothing. And I went in the room, and I was snubbing. I wasn't crying out loud. But all of a sudden, one of my sisters or brothers must have come by, and seen I was crying, heard me snubbing, and went and told Mother. And Mother came in the room all of a sudden. She said, what's wrong with you? And I said, I want to sing. I couldn't pray. I you know, didn't know how to pray. I want to sing. I said, can I go to Mr. Dunbar's and sing? He had two girls. Uh, one was a year younger than me, and one was a year older than me. And uh, his wife had then gone on to glory. And he was raising them. And often that he'd have me go by their house on Sunday, and he'd give us a songbook and line us three kids up in front of him. He'd stand back and look over the shoulder. And we'd just sing and sing, and it, it was wonderful. Well, that's, I was missing revival, and I wanted to sing. If I would have known how to pray, I'd have probably been praying. But the songs was my prayer. So um, we uh, went on then, well, 1929 was a bad year. Um, that's the stock market crashed, 
and none of you remember it. I don't think anybody here old enough to remember it, but it was awful. Not only we didn't have money, I don't think anybody had any money. And uh, if you had, you, you just didn't have anything. What you had to eat was what you raised on the farm. That's all we ever had. And but we, mother and dad raised everything you could think of, fruit trees of all kinds and all vegetables and everything. We had. I didn't know we was poor. You know, they provided good for us. But 19 and 30 then, on top of the stock market crashing, it was a drought. And the, um, the things that Dad put out, just hot winds just burned them up. Didn't rain, and everything got burned up. Well, I'd hear him at night laying in bed, and, oh, I don't know, everything's going to be gone. We won't have nothing. Oh, I, I think, why don't you be still? Because I thought we was doing real good, <laughs> just a kid. So uh, anyway... Uh, he came, uh, they took me to the hotel and got me a job. I was 15 years old, and uh, I was cleaning rooms in the hotel, but it didn't pay much, naturally, very little. And um, so then he came up there one day and got me, and he said, Pearl has a job. Pearl was my older sister. He said, Pearl has a job for you in St. Louis and uh, we're going to send you there. I thought, okay. And, and uh, a hunter where we lived, everybody knew everybody. Like I'd say, hi, Carol, hi, Carl, hi, this. You knew everybody that was there. And I suppose that's the way the world was. If we'd gone farther than five miles from home, <laughs> we was almost on foreign tor territory. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, so I was really a greenhorn, you know. And so anyway, my dad took me in the wagon and over to some neighbor's house. He'd done made provisions. And this neighbor had a car, very few cars. Uh, he's the only one I know in that 10-mile radius that had a car. And he, he said he would take me to the, the uh, depot to get the train to go to St. Louis. So my dad took me in the wagon over to his house, and while we was waiting for them to get ready, my dad said, come outside, though, I want to talk to you. And I went outside, and he said, now, we wouldn't let you go at all. You're too young. You're too, you know, only 16 by that time. He said, but uh, we haven't raised anything, and I don't know what we're going to do. See, there would still be six kids home, and then him and Mom made eight even after I left. And that many mouths to feed and care for. He said, I don't know, we may just starve to death. And, but he said, if, if you go to St. Louis and work, at least you'll have something to eat and a place to stay. So, okay, Greenhorn, what Dad said, go, go. So, um, he said, now, when you get uh, up to the depot, get your ticket and go sit down. And he said, don't talk to nobody. And uh, when the train comes in, you just go with, the, there'll be some others getting on. You just follow them, get on the train, get your seat and sit down. And he said, now, when you get to St. Louis, Pearl may not be at the uh, station to greet you. That her desire is to, but she said if she didn't get there in time, you follow the crowd right into the depot in St. Louis and find a seat, and then said Pearl would find me. And so, okay, I got the train came and I followed the crowd. We got on and um, sat down, and two women in front of me was talking, and I thought, well, they're from St. Louis. I could tell what they said. So I punched them. I said, you folks from St. Louis? And they said, yeah. I said, well, you probably know my sister Pearl. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't even answer me. They, <laughs> they just turned around back to the front again, you know, and I thought, wow. <laughs> and so when I, the train stopped at the station, I 
they told me to follow the crowd, so I followed the crowd to get off, and uh, I felt a hand as I reached down to get a hold of something to hold on to to go down the steps off the train. A hand got mine, and I looked, and there was my sister Pearl. She got there, and so she took me off the train and home, and oh, I'd never seen electric lights before. And those lights they had, they just, around the window, they, nearly all the stores that have them, and they're just chasing. I said, they're chasing one another. You've seen lights like that. And I was just amazed at all the electric lights, man. And I wondered now, how did I go work for wealthy people as green as I was, but I made out fine. Pearl took me, she'd worked for them for six years, and it'd been a couple of years since she didn't, and they got some girls that they didn't care for, so that they had run up to Pearl's house and said, can't you, do you have a sister, can't you bring one? God just worked it out from every end of the line. So uh, she took me down to Kessler's, that was their name, and uh, showed me where all the dishes and this and that. They were Orthodox Jews, so we had, when we had meat, we didn't have no butter or milk or anything like that. Uh, had schmaltz, they called it. We rendered up goose grease, and that's what we used for seasoning instead of butter or anything like that. So when you use meat, we had meat dishes, we called them, that you used. And then if you had fish or something like that, well, that was a milk dishes. And so they'd use milk and butter and so on. And on this side was the milk dishes. And Pearl said, don't get them mixed up. You know, you always know. She showed me everything, the, even the silverware, the drawer under the meat dishes had the silverware for them, and the, and the, the other side had milk dishes, had silverware drawer you pull out. You had to know what to use. And a lot of people wouldn't work for them. When I left, uh, she had uh, put an ad in the paper for somebody to come, and a girl was coming to try out. And Miss Kessler told me, she said, now you tell her when she comes, sure the milk dishes and the meat dishes, she said, I doubt you'll get away from there because she probably won't stay. And I thought, well, why? So even pots and pans, there was meat pots and pans and milk pots and pans. I mean, they was real Orthodox Jews. They was very strict. And um, so the girl came, and I was showing her different things that she would do when I came to that. And I said, now this is the meat dishes on this side, and this is milk. She turned to me and she said, you don't mean it. I said, yeah. She said, honey, I'll stay here till you get gone if you want me to, but I'm not going to work for them. <laughs> I said, no, that's okay. So she didn't stay. I seen what Miss Kessler meant. They, when they see that there's so much to do like that, they don't stay. So anyway, uh, there I was, uh, Greenhorn, from down the country and up in the city, and I'm going down the street one day to get a loaf of bread, the little grocery store not far from the house, and I see a girl coming, and I, I look and I thought, man, that looks like one of the Oakley girls, but that was from down, way down where I come from, and she, I seen her eye on me as she got there, and, I said to her, are you an Oakley girl? She said, yeah. Are you one of the web girls? I said, yeah. But see, we lived in foreign lands. She's about eight miles from me. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't meet unless it was something real special, revival or, or the Brush Arbor meeting once I went and seen them. And you knew the Oakleys, they all looked alike. And she knew the webs. I guess we all looked alike. <laughs> So anyway, she said, would you like to go to church? We talked a while there. Oh, we were so happy to see one another. You'd think we were cousins. And um, she said, would you like to go to church, Pentecostal church, where Lulu Peters go? Lulu Peters was a preacher woman, and she had preached down in uh, Oakley's part of the country. They'd made a brush arbor because 
you know, Pentecost just coming in. They didn't have money to make how, uh, churches or nothing like that. So they made brush arbors. I don't know if you know what they're like, but we went to a meeting one night when Lula Peters was preaching. And um, so anyway, she said, you want to go to the church? Uh, Lula had moved to St. Louis too. She said, you want to go where? She said, yes. I said, I do. So uh, she said, well, next time we're off, I'll, I'll take you. So uh, we went and we had to ride three different streetcars, ride one up to a certain place and then get off and get on another one going and then get on the third one. It took me to where the church was. So we went over there. And you know, when I walked in that church, there's something just enveloped me. And I thought, this is what I want. I, I just knew this. Uh, well, she told me, she said, you know, Sheehan's uh, moved here too. She said, I'll take you over to see them. Well, Sheehan's was just a name with me. I didn't remember ever meeting them, but they lived down in her part of the country. So she said, they moved up here and I'll take you over there. Well, we went over and they had a young man named Martin and he was maybe a year older than me. And he just attached himself to me of his own accord. When I would go to church, when I'd get off the streetcar, uh, a block, long block, it should have been two, but there was no street coming through. And uh, when the, uh, the uh, streetcar would stop and I'd get off, there was Martin standing there, get me by the arm, go to church. Well, first time or two wasn't too bad. And then when we get to church, he sat down by me. And then when the church was over, he said, okay, let's go. And he'd take me back to the streetcar. Well, and then I, and I wanted to go to church all the time. And so one time he said, on Sunday night at 6.30, the youth uh, service started. And then by 8 o'clock, they dismissed, and the regular service started at 8 o'clock. And uh, so he said, let's go to the theater tonight at one of the times. I said, I don't want to. He said, uh, well, you don't need to go to church twice. You go to the youth service, and then you stay there and go to the other service. As he said, you don't play fair. I thought, play fair? I don't want to go to the theater. But I didn't tell him, but I did try to give him hints that I didn't want him. And... Um, <laughs> And so uh, I thought I'd give enough of them, and I was going to church that night, and I thought, good, I feel free. He won't be there when I get off the streetcar. And I wanted to go to the altar, and you can't go to the altar. Some guy standing there saying, come on, let's go to, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I said, Lord, give me a boyfriend that just goes to church. Amen. So... Um, He'll answer your prayer, but sometimes you don't want it when the Lord answers. <laughs> <laughs> there was a young man that sat by Brother Height all the time, and he'd get up and lead the congregational singing, or he'd get up and open service with a prayer, and, uh, he'd, you know, real active in the church. And so I made my own decision. I thought, that's probably Brother Height's nephew. And I didn't care for him. You know, you want somebody tall, dark, and handsome. <laughs> so, anyway, um, I got off the streetcar that night thinking that I'm free now. And here that guy gets me by the arm and goes to church again. So I thought, okay, I have to tell you in plain words. When we got up there, I said, I don't want you to meet the streetcar anymore for me. I don't want you to sit by me in church, and I don't want you to walk me back to the streetcar after church. I just had to tell him plain words. He didn't take hints. <laughs> so uh, I never seen him no more. Now, I don't know if he came to church and sit in the back. I don't know. I never seen him. So when I went to church, I thought, oh, good. He wasn't around. I can go to the altar now if I want to. So when that altar service was open, then I hit the altar. I was so happy. And some women was praying for me. Usually the women prayed with women, 
and the men prayed when men come to the altar and prayed with them. So they was praying with me, and all of a sudden I hear a masculine voice, you know, and I'm kneeling, praying, and I'm thinking, who is that? And I opened my eyes a little bit to see, and I thought, that's men's shoes right there, shiny shoes. I can't imagine. I thought, I don't have the right feeling. That guy's after me. I don't know who he is. <laughs> so I got up from the altar, looked at him, and I thought, oh, Lord, that's Brother Height's nephew. <laughs> and I thought, I can't hurt their feelings. You know, you can't just say, go on, I don't want you. I wanted the Holy Ghost. I wanted what they had. And so uh, he starts in. Oh, this is the way you yield to the altar. It had me sit down there on the altar, and he's talking to me, talking to me. In my mind, I'm thinking, how am I going to get out of here? <laughs> so I thought, I got up and started walking. He just walked right around by me and just and tell me, you do this, you do that, and you do that. I think, I'd get over this way. Okay, he follows right along with me. I thought, what am I going to do? So uh, he came to his mother, which I didn't know. I didn't know anybody. He kissed his mother on the cheek and said, I'll see you later, mother. Well, the youth leader was the old maid, and she just loved the youth, and they all loved her. So she looked over and seen it. She's over against the wall. She hollered, Cal, throw me one of them kisses. So when he turned around, I got out the door behind Brother Hyde. And uh, I thought I had it made then. And Brother Height looked around. He was a big man, and he had a big voice. He said, where did that girly go? I thought, oh. <laughs> and then he looked up and seen me running. He said, there she is. He said, good night, girly. <laughs> and then I heard him say, Brother Cal, that's a fine girl. I thought, oh, no. <laughs> So I started running. I really run. <laughs> I got down about halfway of that long block, and I looked back, and the street lights showed me there was nobody following me. I thought, oh, good. So about that time, car slid up the curb, and the guy said, could I take you home? And I looked up, and it was that guy. I thought, oh, no. So I thought real fast. I said, no, I live too far out. I thought all them people of Pentecost, there's poor people, and they lived right around the church. I thought I was the only one that come in a long ways. So I said, oh, no, I live too far out. He said, where do you live? I said, I tried to make it long as I could. <laughs> Way out in the edge of Clayton. He said, that's on my way home. And I, I was I was mad by then, <laughs> and I was hot from running and sweating, you know. <laughs> I got in the car. I thought, what do you do? Just say I don't want to go with you. I couldn't. I couldn't do that. That was Brother Height's nephew. So anyway, he he took me home, and uh, he said, you know, next Sunday uh, we're supposed to go to my best friend's house, and uh, they're fixing dinner. It was Mother's Day. Now, I wasn't a mother. I was only 20 years old. He wasn't the father. Uh, why did the woman, he just made it up when he left me. He probably went and called him and said, you fix dinner. Because <laughs> he'd do them things. And so I told him, I had to think real fast again. I said, oh, I can't do it. Uh, he said, go with me. they got a daughter, and she is a wonderful girl. I just want you to meet her. Oh, Betty is such a great girl, you know, and so on. I said, I can't do it because, he said, why? My sister always comes and gets me. She didn't always. She did if I wanted her to. But <laughs> I said, she comes and gets me when I get off from work. He said, well, you've got a telephone. You can call and tell her you got a date. Oh, Lord. He could knock down anything I wanted. So he talked so like, a, I'm doing you a favor. I want you to meet the girl. I want you to have friends. You're just here, you know. And 
okay. He was my chauffeur. So next Sunday, we went to Betty's house. And Betty lived with her mother because she's a young girl and her dad had done deceased, so them two lived together. So when we got to the house, uh, Betty's mother, I remember real plainly, coming out to meet the car. And Betty, I don't know. And so anyway, I didn't wait for Calvin Albert. I just got out of the car and went with the mother and we was talking, went in the house and she said, I got dinner on the table and so we all sat down and ate. When we got done, uh, she's picking up the dishes and I went to picking them up and helping her. She said, no, no, you don't have to help me. She said, you go in with the young people. I said, no, I'm going to dry the dishes. I said, you wash them and I'll dry them. So she couldn't get rid of me. So we, I, wore, I dried the dishes and I said, your apron is so pretty. It was so different from, you know, they used to get dressed and then put an apron on to do the dinner. And uh, she said, well, I made it. She said, do you sew? I, yeah. She said, well, when we get done to the dishes, I'll show you my patterns. So when we got done with the dishes, we went in her sewing room. She got the patterns out, showed me the patterns that she'd made, gave me the pattern to that uh, apron that I liked. She said, here, just take it home. You can make you one. And uh, so by that time, it's time to go back for the 630 service for the young people. So Calvin Albert said, come on. I thought, okay, he's the chauffeur. So <laughs> we went and got in the car and went on back. And I, I didn't talk much to Betty. I, I don't remember talking to any. But her mother was the loveliest thing. We just talked. You thought we knew one another. So anyway, then uh, he... He kept talking about, oh, where I live down in South St. Louis, they're all, um, oh, I forget what kind of people, German. And he said, they are so clean and neat. Their houses, they keep their property up. The, oh, he would just talk about the fence rows. So finally he said, I'd like to take you down where we live and show you, you know, still chauffeur. Uh, I didn't want to go. I didn't care about the houses and the cleanliness, but... Okay, so I went with him and drove down. That's the house we live in there. And look at these property. Well, they didn't look much different than anybody else as far as I was concerned. <laughs> I guess you just have to have a knack for it. So anyway, when we was going back, we went straight Gravoy, and he lived in South St. Louis, and the church was North St. Louis, and we lived west, away west. So when he's going to grab I thought, they don't go to church like this. He said, they go by my house. That's on his way. So finally I said, do you go by where I live when you go to church? He said, no. I said, well, you told me that that was on your way home. He said, it was that night. <laughs> <laughs> you could see what I had to deal with. So anyway, as the gang says, if you can't lick them, join them. So we got married. <laughs> and a year's time. And so he told me, he said, I'm called to the ministry. He told me that after he got me to say yes. He said, I hope you, uh, you know, wouldn't mind that. I have to preach. God called me to preach. I thought, I don't care. All I want to do is go to church. If I get somebody to go to church, that's fine. And so it went on for a while, and Brother Hyde kept saying, Cal, you better cut the shorelines and get out there and go. Yeah, we will. We are both willing. We'd talk about it. Yeah, someday we'll have to go. And uh, so time went on, and Brother Hyde came by the house, and he said, tell Cal after supper tonight, come over. I got, I'm going to talk to him. And I thought, well, he wants to talk to him about some of the business of the church because even though Cal was young, he was on the church board. When Brother Hyde put him on there when he was 18, he told me. He said, Brother Hyde put me on the church board, and he said, now these are all older men on the board. You don't have nothing to say. I just want you to see how the church is run. He always urged my husband, God's called you, and you've got to go, and I'm neutering you in all of this. 
So uh, he was on the church board. Naturally, I thought, well, something about the church board. He went over there after church, after we ate supper, and I put the kids to bed and went to bed. And uh, he came back, oh, maybe 9.30, something like that, which was late for us because he worked every day at the pattern making. And you'd get the bed. So when he came in, I, I sat up in bed and I said, uh, what did Brother Height want? He said, well, uh, some people in Hannibal started a church and they don't have a pastor and the man and his wife is holding it together till they could get a pastor for it. And uh, he wondered if I wanted to go. Well, just before that, though, it's, no. He said uh, uh, they wanted us to go to Little Rock. That's where it was. Try out for this pastor because the pastor had just left there. And uh, so cancel out the other one. I'll come to that later. <laughs> and uh, so... Um, we went, uh, to, well, he said, go to Little Rock. And I thought, oh, my Lord, we can't do it. Darkus was only about three or four years old, four maybe. And every time she wanted to go outside and play, and if I let her go out, she'd head for the street. There was a street went by us that way and one in front of us. And uh, if I'd stay out there, she'd play in the yard. And I went in the house and looked out the window, and she'd just be heading for the street you know she did that once as a woman came bring her to me and said you're a little girl about got hit by a car well that I couldn't let her out and I kept saying I guess in front of my father-in-law that I couldn't let darkest out to play because I just when I'm out there's all she could stay he said well we'll fix that we'll put a, a fence around the yard so he did he put the fence around and then, then after this, this when Brother Hyde said, you're going to go to Little Rock and try out for church. I sit up there in bed, and I thought, oh, my Lord, we can't do it. We just got the fence so Darkus can go out and play. <laughs> and we got this other baby. And uh, Little Rock, oh, my. I thought, that's horrible. And I, but I didn't say a word. I wouldn't discourage him. I laid back down in bed. He got ready for bed, went to bed, just got to sleep good, and a light shone over him. It was about the size of a headlight on a, a car, and it shone over him onto me and woke me up. And I, at first I thought, a burglar. And then just like a peace settled over me. It's the Lord. And I thought, oh. And um, with that, a wire like came down, and into this ear, I can only tell you what I really felt. I'm not making up nothing. Came in and said, I have called you. A voice said, I have called you. You must obey me. And I thought, oh, we don't know what to do. Said, go where thou wilt. I will lead thee. And with that, it was all gone. And I sat right up in bed, like my head was just bound with fibers. It was tight. Tears were just rolling, and I was shaking all over. And so I shook my husband, and I said, wake up. He said, what's wrong with you? I told him what happened. He said, well, you know we have to go. Turn this back to me. <laughs> <laughs> Went right on to sleep. I sat there while shaking and trembling. I thought, oh, Lord, I laid down. And... So we went to Little Rock later to try out. And uh, all the way down there, I'm thinking, we can't do it. We can't do it. This is too far. But I didn't tell him. And uh, so when church was over, the presbyter was there to try to pick a pastor for the church. And uh, he came up to my husband. And he said, well, Brother Albert, what do you think? Do you want it? I'm sure Brother Hyde told him, Put him in there, because Brother Hyde was just determined, cut the shorelines, get out and go to preaching. One reason was that uh, Pentecost was new and there wasn't many churches, and those old-timers, all they wanted was to spread the gospel. They wasn't building nothing for themselves. Get, you can preach, go preach. You go preach. You. So anyway, 
when church was over and the presbyter said, what do you think? My husband said, well, if they vote me in, I would take it. And I thought, oh, good, that sounds like you don't want it. You know, and I'm sure the presbyter thought the same thing. <laughs> You're not interested. So we went on home. We never heard from them. I thought, oh, we got by. That's wonderful. So went went on for a while, and my husband came home from work one day early, and I met him at the door. I said, what's wrong with you? He said, I can't work. I just can't do it. He said, let's pray. Just kneel down right here with a couch. So we knelt down to pray, Lord, what do you want us to do? And uh, all of a sudden the phone rang, and he went and answered the phone. I just sat down on the floor until he came back. And I said, who was that? He said, that was Sister Smith from Root House, Illinois. I said, well, what did she want? We only knew her by name because uh, Calvin's sister Ruth had preached for uh, Sister Smith in Root House. That's all we knew a year, a years before. So anyway, um, he said, well, she's got a church there. She started it. And uh, she said, it's to the point now where we need a pastor for the church. And she said, when I pray, uh, I just can't get past you, Brother Albert. said, I think you should come up. He said, okay, we'll be there Sunday. So we went up to the church and... Um, so uh, she convinced us that that's what God wanted us to do. So, okay. We moved there. Uh, first, we went into the back room of the church, and uh, that's where we lived for a few months. And then we rented a nice house and had to call St. Louis, bring our furniture. So the move men brought our furniture, and we, we was there about a year in Root House. But, you know, the people loved Sister Smith, so did we. She was a wonderful woman. But if they needed anything in the instruction, they'd go ask her, Sister Smith, what about this, what about that? And so my husband one day said, oh, let's don't stay here. He said, they don't need a pastor. Sister Smith fulfills everything, you know. He said, uh, I heard that they're paying good money in Detroit, Michigan for pattern making, and I'd like to go there. I said, fine okay with me so uh, um, we told Sister Smith well she cried and wouldn't hardly talk to us after that I guess she just couldn't stand to talk and uh, but we went ahead had the move in to come and get our furniture and take it back to St. Louis and put it in storage so we went on to Detroit and we lived in a, a motel for a few months so we could get situated, and he got a job, and we were okay. And um, one night uh, in the night, after we was in this house for a while, and the Lord spoke to me in the night and said, if you don't work for me here, I'll send you to Portugal. And so I seen my husband standing, shaving, and I told him about it. I said, uh, Lord said, if you don't work for me here, I'll send you to Portugal. So, okay, next morning when we woke up, he was up getting his clothes on, and I said, where is Portugal? He said, what do you mean, where is Portugal? I said, well, you know, I told you the Lord said that if you don't work for me here, I'll send you to Portugal. He said, you didn't tell me nothing. He said, this is another one of your dreams. Tell me about it. I said, well, that's all there was to it. Lord said, if you don't work for me here, I'll send you to Portugal. And then I told you, I said, you were standing there shaving when I told you. He said, I wasn't shaving. I'm just getting out of bed now. Haven't shaved yet. I thought, oh, that's right. But everything is so real to you. So... um we went on for a while, and I began to get sick. I just, I just couldn't stand up to do my work. Uh, I'd try to cook supper. I'd pull a chair up to the stove and sit there and try to stir the stuff. And my husband 
finally he said, you're going to the doctor. So he'd ask me, where do you hurt? Uh, I don't hurt nowhere. I just, I couldn't go. And uh, he said, okay, we're going to the doctor. So I went, and the doctor took a lot of tests, and he said, finally at the end, he looked at me, felt sorry for me, I guess. He said, I know you're sick. But he turned to my husband, he said, I don't find one thing wrong with her. I don't know what to do. He said, the only thing I know, I'll send you to a doctor that will just talk to her. Maybe he can weed out what the problem is, which probably was a psychiatrist. He didn't call her name. He said, it'll cost you $25 to go talk to him. My husband said, it's okay if we can just get to the bottom of it. So... Um, he, he told us, he said, get a, um, an appointment with your doctor and he'll give you all the results of all we've done. So anyway, we went to the psychiatrist. He asked me, he said, where'd you come from? When did you get here? How long have you been here? What are you doing here? And I answered all those questions. And finally he said, uh, maybe you don't want to live here. Maybe you'd rather live somewhere else. I said, no. Anywhere that my husband can work, I'm willing to live there. He said, do you just tell yourself that? I said, no. So he sat there. He said, well, okay. He said, you can go. Uh, and he said, just check with your doctor and uh, see what the results are. He said, if I was a betting man, I'd bet you could go and leave the doctors alone. You'd be all right. Well, I was sick. So anyway, my husband went to work, and the work, uh, it was a war time. It was 1944 by that time. And uh, there was just plenty of work uh, and that kind of work, foundry and stuff. And uh, the boss said, I'm going to put on second shift because we just can't get the work all done on the one shift. And they put Calvin Albert on the second shift, go to work at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, get off at midnight. And so my husband said, I'm not going to do that. Told me after, I think he worked it once. Seemed to me like I laid in bed wondering whenever is he coming home. Uh, yeah. And uh, so anyway, uh, he didn't hear him on work at that. I said, okay. He said, let's go back to St. Louis. I said, okay, with me. So he said, listen, uh, uh, my sister, oldest sister, it was his oldest sister, Ethel, had never seen me. She'd lived in California all the time. We were married and all. And she said, he said, she's never seen you or the kids. And let's take a trip out there first. And then we'd come back to St. Louis, I'd get a job, because that was no problem. There was so much work in the pattern shops that the first one he'd go in, they'd take him. So um, anyway, we was all had, he was just so happy with going to California, see his sister, and show his family off. And um, so we called uh, the movers, asked them if they would come and get our furniture, I imagine they said, why don't that young couple make up their mind where they want to live? But uh, come get the furniture. Okay, in a couple of days they could make it, about two more days. So we went by the doctor's office first, and uh, he gave us the envelope with all the results of the tests. He said, you take them. When you get in St. Louis, you go get your doctor and give them all these tests, and you won't have to go through them again. So I took them. And um, so uh, um, we began to uh, pack everything and moved everything out naturally. We wanted to clean around where the sofa did sit, one dust everything, get, and uh, got a sofa and a chair and all the boxes and stuff in the middle floor. And, and um, uh, all of a sudden that afternoon, well, I said to my husband, we have to put these, the sofa back in place. He said, no, the movement will be here tomorrow. They just pick it up and take it out. Just leave it where it is. We've got the floor all clean. Okay. So the doorbell rang, and I thought, oh, my Lord, living room. Open the door and hear everything in the middle of the floor. 
and it was a brother Johnson. We had gone to his church. We went to three churches in Detroit, and we didn't fit in none of them. Can you imagine why? Running from the Lord. And so uh, we'd gone to Brother Johnson's once, and so he said, uh, I said to him, I can't ask you to sit down. Everything's in the middle of the floor. He said, it's okay. He said, Brother Brandon called me from St. Louis and said to tell Brother Albert to call him because he didn't know how to get a hold of him. And I said, okay, when he comes in, I'll tell him. So when he came in, I said, go call Brother Brandon. Brother Johnson was here and said, Brother Brandon wants to talk to you. He said, okay. So he went to uh, the um, telephone booth that was on the street, you know, how they had little square booths, and that's where we had to go to use the telephone because we didn't have one. He went out and called Brother Branding and came back. I said, uh, what did he want? He said, uh, well, they're starting a church in Hannibal. This is where it was. And uh, they, there's a couple, a uh, man and his wife, trying to hold it together and wanted him to come. I said, what did you tell him? He said, I told him, oh, no, we're going to California to see my sister. I thought, well, we're not going to live there. You know, but he was so excited he's going to see his sister. And I said to him, you go back and call Brother Brandon, tell him tomorrow when the movement get our furniture, we'll just head for St. Louis and we'll talk to him. I said, this may be the Lord. You know, we'd run so much. I thought, okay. So he went back to the booth again and called Brother Brandon, told him we'll be there tomorrow. Well, when we got there uh, to Brother Brandon, he said, Brother Albert, if you don't take the church, you are missing the Lord. If you just come out and plain words. Brother Brandon is going to tell you which way the land lies. And uh, he said, you better go. You're missing God. So I said, okay, we'll go. I don't want to miss it no more. And uh, we, so he said, go up to Hannibal now and talk to him. Let him know you're coming. Tell them when you'll be back from California. Go ahead with your California trip. When you come back, and then come to Hannibal and stay there. So we went out and met the people and the man and his wife that was uh, holding the church together. He claimed he was head of the house, and she said, yes, but I'm the neck that turns the head. And she was. <laughs> she, you remember them? Yes. And uh, so... We told them we'd be back in a week from California, and we were going to move in. So they got busy and cleaned that upstairs rooms. There was um, about five, six rooms up there, nice. And when we came back, it was all ready. We called and had our furniture brought in from St. Louis. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we had... Revival, oh, Brother Young, Claude Young, was really a fiery preacher. And he preached for us, and then he'd gone, and then he came back. He said, Brother Albert, I got a, uh, some folks saved down in Kennett, Missouri. He said, you ought to have them up here. They are wonderful. That was Mac and Norman Luna. Yeah, and Carl and Olin. Oh, Chuck Gray, can't leave him out. And uh, I don't know, there's several workers. And so we brought them up. Well, they had just got the Holy Ghost, and they was on fire for God. You can hardly say God without them just taking off, and they're gone, you know. So uh, we went down in the church um, to, for him to see the, this thing, microphone, how it's set up. We had a, just a long stem one. And um, he could, we turned it on, let him see how it was. Uh, that was Carl, I guess. And uh, so everything's fine. But they got shouting even there, and just us in there. Oh, they, they were just full of the Holy Ghost. And then um, we kept evangelists. We always kept them in our home. And we had all of them there, and I was cooking for everybody, served the three meals a day, and all of a sudden I, I thought, well, I'm doing all the work, and I can do it. 
And I said to my husband, oh, should I throw that envelope away that um, the doctor had sent by me to the doctor there? I said, you know, I'm playing the piano for church. I'm working the altar. I'm keeping evangelists. I'm feeding them. I said, I feel good. I'm strong. But if just God, he's getting us in the right place. And so um, we stayed there about 40, almost 40 years. We wouldn't move no more. <laughs> uh, all right, anybody get a touch from the Lord on your heart, it'll change you. It, it'll make you different. I thought a while ago, uh, I was telling Sonny yesterday, when the Lord touches me or gives me anything, it's just like I burn. I just burn, and I, I have to get my mind off of it to, you know. I thought, well, he don't understand. When I got on, he has the same thing. And I thought, Brother Ashton said, the Holy Ghost and fire. I thought, yeah, that's a fire that just burns in you Amen. when you um, feel the presence of the Lord. And if you need anything, you say, I'd like to know the Lord's direction for my life. God has a a direction for everybody there is a reason and nobody should just sit down uh, you know get in your find your place and get in and work for the Lord and uh, so I thought to, today you might want to come by and let the preachers lay their hand on you or you may have trials you're going through and you don't know what to do but you know when the Lord touches you you feel like everything will be all right. It's going to be all right. Even though it's still just like it was before, he touched you. Now it's all right. So, Brother Sonny, coming. Brother Ashton.